Hi, I am Rachel Meliotis, a senior editor here at O'Reilly Media, and I am here today with Paco Nathan. He is a director of data science at Concurrent and an O'Reilly author of Enterprise Data Workflows with Cascading, and he is also speaking at OzCon 2013. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, Rachel. Tell me about Cascading. Well, uh, Cascading is an abstraction layer. It's on top of Apache Hadoop. So, uh, you know, one thing I, I generally talk about when I'm describing it is that Hadoop is rarely used in isolation. You almost always use Hadoop with uh, some data that's coming out of maybe HBase or Cassandra, maybe some other data out of MySQL, maybe some log files. But you never just use Hadoop alone. And, and also, when you run apps on Hadoop, they tend to be use cases that uh, the results get pushed somewhere else. So maybe Memcache or some kind of web app. So the thing about cascading is it provides an abstraction layer. Uh, you can think of it as a kind of middleware for big data, where you're integrating these workflows that include Hadoop to do the heavy lifting, but also include these other frameworks. So tell me why use cascading over another tool. What are its strengths, weaknesses, that sort of thing? Well, they, you know, on the strengths, um, the main thing is that you you define a pipeline, you define a workflow as a data pipeline, and the compiler takes and, and generates the plan, which will create all the Hadoop jobs, and it the app becomes one jar file. So the main thing is that rather than having developers uh, work more piecemeal and define individual MapReduce uh, job steps, and rather than trying to, uh, you know, use scripting or, or, or some other approach to pull together uh, a lot of different apps into a, a common workflow. Uh, what cascading allows is a way that uh, you can define the business logic at a very high level, and you have some guarantees about best practices being enforced, and it also allows the compiler to do its tricks to make these apps much more parallel at scale. Um, so at the end of the day, you end up with one jar file. It's a lot easier for the ops people to handle. Uh, a lot easier to troubleshoot and instrument, things like that. So it definitely sounds like a tool for enterprise. Yes, very much so. Uh, it came out of, uh, Chris Wenzel wrote the API, and he was working at Thompson at the time. He was evaluating the Nutch project uh, very early on, uh, before he even had a name. But he was looking to see, can these open source technologies really be leveraged in enterprise? And his takeaway was, it was going to be really difficult to find a lot of expert Java developers who were working directly in Hadoop. Um, on the other hand, inside of Enterprise, you typically have a lot of expert Java developers working in uh, J2EE, say. So the idea was to give them an API which uh, their compilers and, and their tooling, um, it, wor it worked very seamlessly with that and, and very much spoke to their, uh, their strengths, their skill sets. So if someone is going to be embarking on an Enterprise app and wants to use cascading, as well as everything else that goes with it. What are some best practices that you would tell people that you wish you had known maybe when you first started out with this? <laughs> well, it, there's really three points on that. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is that uh, cascading provides a way of doing test-driven development at scale. And so that's very interesting because usually when we talk about big data, uh, test-driven development and unit tests are, are, are not something that's part of the dialogue. Um, so there's actually a way that you can use what we call assertions. Uh, inside of the data pipeline, you can assert preconditions, postconditions on different processing. And then you can use that to trap exceptional data and maybe uh, shunt that exceptional data out to customer support to handle very specially. But the same mechanism allows you to do test-driven development um, and also to do things like checkpoints and uh, different types of troubleshooting. Um, so that's one of the best practices. Uh, the other one is that cascading is, is what we call a pattern language. So if you can think of uh, kiddos building a big tower in Lego blocks, there, there are some properties that are guaranteed when you're playing with Lego blocks that if you snap them together correctly, they'll stand up. But if you don't snap them together correctly, they'll probably fall over. So a pattern language is a way of conveying best practices to more novice users. And it's also a way of giving a lot of great hints and suggestions to the compiler. Uh, so by having that pattern language, uh, you, you get this kind of separation of concerns where 
you work at a relatively high level implementing the business logic as, as workflows, but then you have some guarantees that the compiler can do smart things to parallelize it underneath. Um, the third thing about best practice is really interesting. This has evolved much more recently, but there's a kind of design pattern that we see in enterprise apps. And in fact, I'm struggling to find uh, large-scale batch workflows which, uh, which are outside of this pattern. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find use cases. Uh, so the thing there is that you know, typically if I go into a large enterprise IT shop, they've got these apps that take data from a lot of different sources, structured and unstructured, all combined. They run a lot of ETL, extract, transform, and load. And they're typically using SQL, enterprise SQL, to do ETL. Uh, they usually have some kind of business logic, some custom way of preparing their data, some secret sauce, basically. <laughs> Very proprietary. And then they usually have some kind of analytics. Once that data is prepared, they apply some predictive modeling or recommenders, and a fraud, things like that. And then they have to get those results out to the end use cases. So what's interesting is that we see enterprise, uh, you know, I talk to engineering directors who have this responsibility. They may have five different teams, each doing a different piece of this, this app. And they struggle with trying to, to pull it all together. Um, so one of the things that's interesting with cascading is you can take the input sources and define them as part of your workflow very formally. You can, uh, you can import the NC SQL directly and have uh, cascading create parts of the pipeline from that directly. You can do all of the, the business logic for the pipelines. That's, that's sort of the stock and trade for cascading always. And you can also take output, take models from SAS and SPSS and R and other kinds of analytic frameworks. And also cascading can read those and create uh, parts of the data pipelines. So at the end of the day, you may have five different departments, each with their own work product, their own piece of the puzzle, but they all get put into the same app, and the compiler sees the whole thing as one continuous flow. And so there's all kinds of opportunities for the compiler to optimize, to handle uh, exception handling, uh, troubleshooting, notifications, all of the good things that, that enterprise IT worries about. That is some great advice. Um, so you are also presenting at OzCon, which is fantastic, Looking and forward. you are using Cascalog, which I hope I'm saying right, uh, yes. to, to build an app um, with uh, the city of Palo Alto, Open Data. Can you tell me all about the project and, and Cascalog? Certainly. Well, the, the project itself uh, came out of a, a machine learning workshop I was doing at CMU, and we've done that a couple years in a row. Uh, it's kind of an ongoing project. Uh, and I'm also working with the city of Palo Alto on some of their open data kind of community projects related to that. So we, we sort of thought of uh, combining those two. We wanted to use the open data as an example for the students working on machine learning apps. And we thought it would be a, a really great use case for Cascalog. So uh, Cascalog is interesting because it's, it's basically Prolog inside of Lisp inside of Java, <laughs> which, which really sounds confusing, but it works out great. Um, you know, in fact, for cascading apps in production, we're seeing the majority of the large commercial implementations being written in Casklog. And in, and in fact, for the large use cases we know about, they're almost all in Casklog. Um, scalding is coming up in the world, but it's still second place right now. Um, and scalding is the scholar one. So uh, Casklog is a way of uh, representing predicate logic, the prologue parts, about big data. And so you, you do ad hoc queries as these sort of predicate logic statements. And then once you've got a query that's uh, hitting your data the way you want it to, it's one line to turn that into a, a function. And then it's one more line to turn that into a unit test. And so to build these large-scale workflows, you take and compose these functions into apps. And we see side by side that there's generally about an order of magnitude reduction uh, from the size of those queries, those apps in Clojure versus comparable apps written in, in SQL, side-by-side mm -hmm. -side comparison. And the other thing, too, is that this provides a full software development lifecycle, from ad hoc query all the way from modeling, app development, unit tests, etc. Uh, so it's a huge uh, implication for software engineering. That sounds fascinating. Sounds like there's a lot of opportunity with the tool. So um, thank you very much for joining me. And I really found this fascinating. And I can't wait to uh, meet you at OSCON 2013. Thank you, Rachel. Really appreciate it. Really looking forward to OSCON.